So good morning to everyone. Hope you are doing well. In today's session, we are going to discuss a very important topic, not only for the exams, but also for the clinical practice and application in day-to-day -day life in terms of calculating and adjusting insulin doses in different scenarios. And we'll be talking in detail about the insulin carbohydrate ratio calculations, the insulin sensitive factor calculations, also the basics of carbohydrate counting will be discussed. What is a carbohydrate portion? We'll see how we can calculate the basal pump rates as well as the insulin carbohydrate ratio for an insulin pump. Also, we'll look at calculation of the insulin requirement in a patient on enter the feeding. And we'll also go through the sick day rules and certain snack scenarios with insulin use. So let's start right away. So how do we calculate or estimate the insulin dose from a patient's weight? These are general recommendations for an insulin dependent diabetic patient. Insulin requirements uh, for an adult can be calculated from a weight based formula. So for an frail older individual, those who are on CKD stage four or five renal failure or severe hepatic failure, we use a slightly lower dose. Also, in those with newly diagnosed type 1 diabetes, we use a slightly lower dose. And here we are talking about the total daily insulin dose. So total means the sum total of a long-acting and the short-acting insulin. So that is 0.3 times the body weight in kg for the categories which are mentioned in this statement. For all other adults, total daily insulin dose will be 0.5 times the body weight in kg. We always should note that if the body is very resistant to insulin, then we may require a higher dose, which will be 0.7 times the body weight. So that total daily dose will be 0.7 into body weight. On the other hand, if a body is sensitive to insulin, we may require a lower dose. So this is a general example to show the same. So here we have a patient with CKD stage four. So he's in renal failure and he weighs 100 kg. So his total daily insulin requirement, TDD, will be slightly lower compared to a normal adult. So it will be 0.3 times the body weight. So 0.3 times 100 will be 30 units. Now, how do we give the patient the basal bolus? If you want to give the patient basal bolus, so if you want to give the patient long-acting plus short-acting insulin, basal dose will be half of the total daily dose. So it will be 30 divided by 2, that will be 15. And again, bolus dose again will be 30 divided by 2 will be 15, and this 15, we need to spread it out across the three meals. So it will be five unit with each meal. On the other hand, if we plan to give the patient a twice daily pre-mixed insulin, like uh, mixed start 30, or humulin 30, 70, or from that matter, uh, no, I mean, uh, no mix 30 or humulin mix 25, then we are talking about giving the Two third of the dose or 60% of the dose in the morning. That will be the breakfast time. That will be 18 units in this example. And in the evening meal, it will be one third, will be 40%. That will be around 12 units. How about the insulin total daily dose calculation if we have a pregnant lady? So again, weight in this context will be the current weight, not the pre pregnancy weight. It is a weight based dosing which is recommended. For the first trimester, the total daily dose is 0.7 unit per kg. Uh, for the second trimester, this is we're talking about 0.7 per unit per kg per day, okay? Second trimester, it will be 0 0.8 unit per kg per day. Third trimester, it will be 0 0.9 to 1 unit per kg per day. What about type 2 diabetes in general? So usually when we start the patient, uh, on a basal insulin, when there is a failure of the oral therapy or failure to get the HVNC in the target, we add on a bedtime, as per the NICE recommendations, uh, neutral protamine hegdon, which is insultard, which is an intermediate acting insulin. Usual starting dose, we use 10 units per day or 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 unit per kg per day. Of course, if we are not getting the fasting blood sugars in the target, then we need to increase the dose by two to four units once or twice weekly, or we can say 10 to 15%. And 
At the same time, if hypoglycemia occurs, we need to decrease the dose by two to four units or 10 to 20 percent. If the HBNC still is not at target, despite achieving good control of the fasting sugars, then we know the culprit is likely to be the postprandial blood sugars. So we need to add pre-meal insulin. Again, we can start with pre-meal insulin at one particular meal, which is the causing the highest peak of the blood sugars postprandially. So for many times, we may start it with the lunch because lunch is the heaviest meal for the patient in majority of the cases, although it may differ. In some people, dinner may be the heaviest. In some people, breakfast may be the heaviest. So usually we start it with the uh, heaviest meal or the one which is causing the highest postprandial rise of the blood sugar. Initial dose for selecting for pre-meal insulin or the short-acting insulin will be four units or 10% of the basal dose. So whatever is the basal dose, 10% of that will be the ideal starting pre-meal dose for the patient. In terms of uh, adjusting the dose, again, we need to take into consideration two types of readings. One is the postprandial reading. How much is the postprandial rise of the blood sugar? Ideally, if a pre-meal target is up to seven millimole or four to seven millimole for that matter, then maximum rise two hours post-meal that as per the target should be around nine millimole per liter. So usually it will be two millimole per liter more than the pre-meal target. If that is not occurring, then we need to consider increasing the dose by one to two units or 10 to 15% at least twice in the week. I mean, every three days we tend to do that. On the other hand, if the hypoglycemia occurs, we should reduce the dose by two to four units or 10 to 20%. So very simple to remember. This is the general recommendations for a type two diabetes patient. Now let's look at all the important concepts. Uh, with the initial slides, we already know that 50% we should put the basal, 50% we should put the bolus. Now, bolus do dose calculation in a type 1 diabetic, usually they follow the Daphne principles. What is Daphne? Basically, diet adjusted for normal eating, where they took, take into consideration two things to calculate the bolus dose. One is the insulin to carbohydrate ratio, and the other is the correction factor also called as uh, insulin uh, sensitivity factor. So these things we should take into consideration. Now, insulin to carb ratio, what is it and how to calculate? So basically we need to know that amount of insulin which needs to be given for a certain amount of carbohydrate is what is insulin to carb ratio. Usually one unit of the short acting or a rapid acting insulin will cover for 10 grams of the carbohydrate in that meal. That is also referred to as a carbohydrate portion. We also call it 1CP. Many times in the carbohydrate reference list in different books, they will be mentioning 1CP is equivalent to what portion of the food. And so it is easy to remember for many people in that way, how many CPs uh, or carbohydrate portions they are taking with that particular meal. It may be different between individuals. So each individual is different. And at the same time, it may be also different at different meals of the day. So more insulin in some people may be required in the morning. Some people may need more insulin in the afternoon time or more in the evening time. How do we calculate as a rule? We follow the rule of 500 to calculate the insulin to carbohydrate ratio. What is this rule of 500? Basically, we put 500 in the numerator and in the denominator, we put the total daily dose. So for example, if somebody is taking a basal dose or a long acting dose of 26, and for example, 24 for that matter, and he's taking total 26 of the quick acting insulin, then his total daily dose will become 50, 50. So in the numerator, we'll put the 500, and in the denominator, we put the total daily dose, which is 50 in this example. So it will become 500 divided by 50. So very simply, we'll get 10. And that will be the insulin to carbohydrate ratio in this example. So basically, one unit of the short-acting insulin is going to cover for 10 grams of carbohydrate. There are other ways to estimate the insulin to carb ratio. Again, these are all general guides. Every person in every case may be different. It can be estimated on the basis of the total daily dose of insulin as well. So if we are taking, for example, 
a very high dose of insulin, you look at the bottom line, which is more than 120 units per day. This we're talking about the combination, I mean, together adding up the basal and the quick acting insulin. Then the insulin to carbide ratio will be much lower, one is to four. On the other hand, if we are talking about a person who is thin, say for example, 22 to 27, uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, we are talking about the patient who is using a lesser dose of insulin, for example, 22 to 27 units per day, then the uh, insulin to carbide ratio may be slightly higher, that is one is to 20. Now, what we need to understand that, the basically on the top of this list, we have all these patients who are having on an average daily insulin dose less. On the bottom half, the, those who are having a much higher average daily insulin dose. So these are also the patients who are requiring huge doses of insulin and also more insulin resistant. And therefore their insulin to carbohydrate ratio will be lower so that they can get more insulin for the same amount of carbs uh, as the uh, on the top of the list. So basically when we give a patient one is to 10 for that matter, we are giving one unit for 10 grams of carbohydrate. On the other hand, if we have a person who is ha having total daily dose, which is less, say for example, 15 to 18, we are giving one unit for 30 gram of carbohydrate. So it is definitely uh, three times lesser insulin in this case. So just a guide for calculating the insulin carbohydrate ratio on the basis of the total daily dose. Also, we can calculate on the basis of the weight. So I was mentioning in that previous slide about the weight as well. So this is the thing about the weight. So if somebody's weight is, for example, uh, uh, more than 122 kg, then the insulin to carbohydrate ratio will be lesser, of course, because the patient will be more insulin resistant and needing high doses of insulin. At the same time, if we take an example of a weight between 37 to 45, the insulin to carbohydrate ratio will be 1 is to 20. Between 65 to 75 weight, it may be 1 is to 12. Between 78 to 90, it may be 1 is to 10. Again, all of these are general guide. Okay, But the whole concept remains the same, that the thinner the individual or if the total daily dose requirement is less, then the insulin to carbohydrate ratio will be higher. On the other hand, if the weight is high or the total daily dose insulin required is high, then the insulin to carbohydrate ratio will be lower. Lower means more amount of insulin will be needed in this case. So the higher the weight, the more insulin is required to cover the carbs. Okay, so this is the general concept and how we can estimate the insulin carbohydrate ratio. So the free view of this particular lecture has ended. Uh, for access to this full lecture session, please subscribe to my lecture series, which is total of 60 lectures till date. Uh, these uh, will be provided access to via paid subscription plan and uh, all the paid subscribers will be given a lifetime access to all my existing 60 videos lectures which are already on the YouTube channel plus all the upcoming new videos. So whatever lectures or sessions I'll be doing in coming weeks, months and years, all of them will be uh, given access to in the same subscription plan. So for the full subscription details, please email me on mazirules at gmail.com or WhatsApp me on 00971554374497 and have the same number on the Telegram app as well. Uh, just to give a brief overview of the full lecture series, so it includes uh, different topics across diabetes and endocrinology. For diabetes itself, is there are around 19 lectures which I've done across different topics which are useful for the exams as well as for the clinical endocrinology practice. In terms of uh, high yield topics for speciality exam and European board exam, there are around nine sessions which have covered all the previous exam recalls as well as all the high yield topics and themes which are frequently encountered in the uh, specialty exams and the European board exams. In terms of thyroid, apart from the thyroid cancer guidelines which were recently uh, published, plus there are other sessions on different topics uh, related to thyroid uh, across the spectrum of thyroid disease. In terms of adrenal as well, covering all the important topics or sessions which are frequently encountered in exams and in clinical practice. There are two very good sessions on lab endocrinology by Dr. Well Murugan, very helpful for those preparing for uh, DM endo or DNB endocrinology as well. In terms of pituitary also, 
have covered all the important sessions on all the important topics which are frequently encountered in clinical practice and the exams. There are a few sessions on the inherited endocrine syndromes as well. Very important sessions on reproductive endocrinology about uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, gynecomastia, hirsutism, PCOS, diagnosis, evaluation, management. There is a sessions on calcium and bone metabolism, on familial lipid disorders, and uh, sessions on pediatric endocrinology as well. So just to let you know that there are many more sessions coming up. And as I mentioned, that in the same subscription plan or same subscription fee, you will be provided access to all my existing 60 lectures plus all my forthcoming lectures. So thank you very much for subscribing. Thank you very much for supporting.